You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius podcast. I have uh, Dr. Shannon Pendergrast. Uh, he's the CSO, Chief Scientific Officer at Wimir, or Wimir Genomics, it's, uh, spelled Y-M-I-R. The website is ymirbiosciences.com. And it looks like they're looking at how to uh, discover biomarkers using biofluids, like his blood and maybe uh, saliva and other fluids like that, instead of biopsies, which is, which is excellent because uh, so no one likes a biopsy. I've, I've had them and, you know, they're invasive and no fun. So, uh, Dr. Pendergrass, uh, Shannon, thank you for coming. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so tell me about Wymere. What's the, uh, is that the premise of the company? Have I described it right or do you want to yep. it a better way? Yeah, you got, you got the, you got the, um, the goal of the company uh, quite right. And I can tell from personal experience that I also don't like um, tissue biopsies. Um, about 10 years ago, before we started Weimer, I uh, had a scare. I have a, I have a uh, winter allergy, which causes me to cough. And I will probably cough a little bit during this podcast. I apologize for that. I've had it for many years. And a few years ago, about 10 years ago, it was way worse than normal. And I actually got some fluid in my lungs my doctor, a primary care physician, sent me for a uh, X-ray. The X-ray came back looking pretty bad, and my primary care physician actually said, "Shannon, this, this really kind of looks like cancer, lung cancer." And I, I was I was lucky because I'm a biologist and I work in the cancer field, and I knew about my condition before this happened, so I did not take her too seriously. Um, but she did convince me that I, for precautionary reasons, I should go and um, get a CT scan. I got a CT scan and they said, well, you know, it's probably not cancer, but you should probably get this biopsy just to make sure. And I knew that the lung biopsies are, are you know, pretty annoying. They're uncomfortable. You, you have to go under anesthesia. And I said, you know, what are the chances of me having cancer given my history of lung issues? And they said, oh, you, you have, you know, only like one or two percent chance that this is cancer. And I said, well, what's the accuracy of your lung biopsy? And they, they, of course, could not answer that. And of course, I guess I'm giving them a hard time because I know a little bit about diagnostics. And they said, well, it, 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 it's better than one or two percent. I said, well, I, I'm not so sure that that is true, but I will go ahead and I will get the lung biopsy <laughs> just to be safe. So, yeah, I had the lung biopsy. They had to put me under. Uh, I actually did not react well to the anesthesia and uh, they were very close to making me stay overnight because I didn't wake up very quickly. And of course, it wasn't cancer and it, it was exactly what we had thought. I have a, a winter allergy and, and I have lung issues in the winter. So that was all around the time that we, me and my two brothers decided, decided to start a biotech company. And when we were thinking about what we were going to do, I said we should eliminate as many tissue biopsies as possible. And after doing a lot of study, I was an RNA biologist 
uh, we were interested in microRNAs. MicroRNAs are a relatively uh, new field, a kind of uh, RNA that is very important for controlling gene regulation and also is kind of stable. And you can find microRNAs in liquids from the body, biofluids we call them, such as urine, saliva, blood, because they're very stable. They bind to proteins and they're stable. They also um, are found inside extracellular vesicles, which I know that your podcast has an interest in. Oh yeah. And, and so um, they're also extremely stable when found in extracellular vesicles. And extracellular vesicles are small packets that are released by every cell in your body. And they're released from the cells into the extracellular space. There are many different types of them. And they're very good at worming their way into biofluids such as blood and urine. And because they are released from your cells, they contain uh, biomolecules within them that can tell you about your cells. But since they make their way to the urine or the blood, all you need to do is take a blood sample or a urine sample. And if you know where to look and what to look for, you can find out about the organs that they come from. Therefore, they're an important part of this new field, which is generally called the liquid biopsy field, which the goal of is to eliminate these tissue biopsies. That's a long answer to your first question. Okay, Sorry. Okay. So what, what are some of the uh, particular conditions that you want to um, develop these diagnostics for? Because there's endless conditions. And that's, uh, that's what I wanted to ask you first. Yeah, so um, we started uh, looking in the urine. Um, so we actually have two goals in our company. One is to find biomarkers that are suitable for liquid biopsy diagnostics. And the second is to develop tools that will help us and other people uh, find these biomarkers. And if I won't, we did some initial studies uh, looking for microRNAs in urine, and we uh, tried to, do, to isolate the exosomes from the urine, and we found that the, the existing methods at the time, this is about eight years ago, were grossly inadequate for finding, uh, the, uh, to, for isolating these extracellular vesicles and microRNAs from urine. So while we were working out, trying different protocols for existing methods, we actually invented two of our own that worked extremely well uh, for the urine biofluid. And also now we're expanding out into other biofluids. So because we were started off focused on urine, uh, we have focused on prostate cancer, uh, uh, which is a uh, urine is a good biofluid for prostate cancer. We've looked at kidney disease. And recently, through collaboration, we've expanded to non urinary tract diseases um, into liver cancer, just because we found collaborators at Oregon Health and Science and University um, who are very interested in liver cancer. So, those are kind of the three uh, conditions that we're interested in. But you're right. If you look at blood, if you look at urine, you know, if you look at saliva, you can look at, there are hundreds of conditions and diseases um, that you can look at. And certainly the field is huge and pretty much any uh, disease that you tell me about, I'm sure I can find an extracellular vesicle related paper to that disease. Well, this is probably a strange insight, but I, I've been reading a book on exosomes. You know, I'm sure everyone does the same thing in their spare time. But um, <laughs> I read about uh, prostosomes it gets from the prostate, it, um, it sends exosomes into sperm, and it, they modulate the sperm's behavior tremendously. Um, sperm, I guess, can be considered a biofluid um, in terms of prostate cancer. I wonder if that would be a unique and different and effective way of figuring out the condition of the prostate by uh, looking at a sperm sample. Certainly. Seminal fluid is a biofluid that a lot of people study, and they study it for a variety of conditions, including prostate cancer. Um, and again, the urine, uh, you know, is a good place traditionally for prostate cancer as well. Um, there are FDA approved biomarkers in the urine and there's even one, uh, you know, one of those biomarkers can be found in exosomes and a company called exosome diagnostics, um, has a CLIA, um, diagnostic, which uses in part, uh, a, a RNA called PCA3 
which is found in exosomes in urine to uh, help diagnose and stage uh, prostate cancer. So this is not something that's pie in the sky. There are already diagnostics out there that are helping people and helping doctors treat uh, conditions that are based in part on exosome biomarkers. Well, I'm sure it's very doable. So, so what is what are the methods that you've developed? Can you talk about how they work? And are you focused more on looking at again microRNA that are within exosomes? Is that the sweet spot of the diagnostic uh, capability yeah. you want to be good at, or what's your focus? Yeah. So, um, right, we've developed two methods. Uh, we've patented one, and the other one is on, on its way, um, and they are designed to help people discover um, extracellular vesicle-linked uh, biomarkers. Um, I mentioned they are both, one of them is completely urine-specific. It's a uh, small molecule that will precipitate extracellular vesicles from urine, but not use standard uh, precipitation methods such as uh, polyethylene glycol. Um, and that polyethylene glycol has caused problems in downstream analyses, and we have eliminated that issue by using a small molecule. And that, that can precipitate, uh, make fall out of urine, uh, the extracellular vesicles with very little protein, um, uh, non-extracellular vesicle linked protein contamination. And then we have another, and that's called the Weimarite method. And then we have another method, which is a silica-based column which we call Y-matrix, which uh, binds very tightly extracellular vesicles in a variety of biofluids. Urine uh, works very well in saliva. We've, we've tested uh, CSF uh, from the, the spinal column fluid and uh, blood, blood plasma. And this, this binds very tightly. And then we can wash away excess protein and leave behind the extracellular vesicle protein and RNA. And we're using that Y-matrix method in a, a, a collaboration, which I mentioned with OHSU with Dr. Christy Binder and Dr. Charles Thomas at OHSU. And they uh, uh, got us a lot of urine samples of patients who have liver cancer, cirrhosis of the liver and uh, uh, healthy volunteers. And we were looking at the proteins, not the microRNAs. Well, we looked at the microRNAs, but we've gotten really nice results with the proteins from our Y matrix preps from those three groups of patients. And we're very excited. Uh, we believe we found some good candidate biomarkers um, for cirrhosis and for HCC. And, and, and that's something that we're, we're really working on every day. And we're, we're hoping to follow up those, that first pilot study with a much bigger study to validate those biomarkers. Well, it sounds like there may be a trade-off that you know inside of an exosome the microRNA is the most stable, but how many exosomes are in a typical urine sample and how many different types of cells? And how do you figure out what's what? It seems like an unbelievably high number, I guess. Oh, wow. You just brought up a, a fantastic point. <laughs> and there are people at the NIH, there are reviewers from my grants who, who brought up similar points. And, um, and that is a challenge for everyone in the field. So let me just tell you what we've done specifically. Um, I, I've read, and I have not seen data that's, that has really proven this, that over 98% of the extracellular vesicles in urine are from the kidney um, or, or the urinary tract. And therefore, if we're looking for a liver biomarker, that's going to be a very small percentage of the extracellular vesicles uh, for, that might be coming from the liver. And there's two ways we can get around this. One is when we do the actual experiment, so we're comparing the proteins that we get from EVs from patients who have, say, liver cancer from healthy volunteers, we will see, if we look at thousands of proteins using mass spectrometry, we will see, say, 100 to 150 of these proteins are strongly upregulated on average in the people who are sick, who have the liver cancer. And we will sift through those proteins. And all of them are actually candidates um, for, as for biomarkers. But we might lend a little extra weight to those proteins that we know are specifically or semi-specifically uh, expressed in the liver. So out of, say, 100 proteins, 
we found 10 proteins that we know are highly expressed in the liver. And some of those proteins we know are actually upregulated in, in the tissue of liver cancer. So now we're saying that that's when we get excited. That's when we jump up and down. We say, okay, the theory backs up what we're finding uh, empirically. And those are, those are the ones we're most excited about. And those are the ones that we will develop assays to and we'll check up on. And another way to get around this is to say, who cares? So it's quite possible that when you have liver cancer, that macrophages or uh, immune cells in the liver will release all sorts of factors. And those factors, some of them, could actually affect the kidney. There, there's, it's called organ crosstalk. And so it's quite possible that your body's, your liver is telling your kidney, um, whether it's on purpose or not, that, hey, something's going wrong here. And therefore the kidney will respond by producing extracellular vesicles of a certain type. And it could, certainly could be that, uh, you know, liver cancer could change the, the outlook of the, of the proteins from, from the kidney. So um, in some sense, we worry about that problem. And in other sense, we don't care. If we can find a protein in your urine that tells us, hey, this guy or this gal might have liver cancer, then that's a win. And uh, whether the theory or, uh, matches it or not uh, doesn't really matter. And we can always figure out the mechanism later about why this actually happened to occur. Well, I just wonder how important sample prep is and if there's ways to increase the fidelity of it and strengthen weak signals, if these signals are weak in the first place. Sample prep is vitally important. And the NIH is, has flagged uh, sample preparation as something that the field of extracellular vesicles needs to work on. Um, my company has a very has a proprietary method for isolating exosomes. It, it concentrates them. It's very efficient. But the sample, the exosome preps that we get using our methods will be different than the exosome preps that people use in other methods. And there are dozens of methods at this point. So it's really important that we be very careful when comparing uh, one method to another. I'm going to say, hey, I found a biomarker for liver cancer in urine using this method very specifically and give give every detail about how I did that because someone may not be able to replicate that result if they use a different method. Um, and so sample preparation is, is vitally important. And then there are certainly tricks you can do that we did not do in our first experiment to um, specifically look for certain proteins. So for instance, there are receptors that are strongly expressed in the liver. These receptors are known to be on the surface of liver cells. And it's likely that they will be on the surface of extracellular vesicles from the liver. We could take a urine sample and do a, using antibodies, pull out all the vesicles that have this particular receptor before we then look and uh, before we look for the liver cancer biomarkers. And thus we're gonna be enriching, enriching the liver specific vesicles. Now that is something that we put into our proposal. We, we want a grant to, to, to fund this work. And that was something that we had mentioned in our proposal that if our first try didn't work, the next thing we would try would be the sample preparation to try to enrich for liver specific vesicles. Uh, we, we haven't had a chance to do that um, but that is certainly something that we would like to do. And there are lots of people doing things like that, uh, looking at other diseases. Well, since the sample prep and the isolation is so important, and it's so important to the whole field, are there, I don't know why I'm asking this question, but are there NIH, NIH grants that are dependent upon the fact that if you do discover a better method of segregating that, it's public knowledge that could be used by other scientists to advance the field itself. Absolutely. So uh, the, as I said, the NIH has definitely flagged this. Uh, they put out several, uh, they're called uh, funding announcements saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to fund um, uh, proposals that really focus on these vesicles. And that's why, you know, uh, on sample preparation for vesicles and rigor. And, um, you know, we're going to apply for one of those grants and, you um, uh, a lot of people have, and uh, I've talked to some of the people who are running those grants, and, and obviously anyone who's got a method will be very interested in going for those. 
And that's why we patent things. So once we get a patent on a method, uh, you know, we are protected. And now we can tell other people what, what that method is. And if it turns out that it truly is the best method, um, then, then it will be widely distributed. Anyone who, uh, who can figure out, uh, anyone who's an expert in the field will be able to perform that method. Can you share anything that's not proprietary in terms of, you know, what are some of the methods that are commonly used and, you know, some of the effective ones? Just out of curiosity. Well, I mean, the standard uh, methods, it used to be said that the standard method was ultracentrifugation, and that is uh, not a proprietary method. It, it's a very simple method, and we were, it, it, it's simple to do. Any first year graduate student can do it with just a little bit of practice. But the problem with ultracentrifugation, there's a couple of problems with it. One is laborious. So it's simple, but it takes a long time. And that's fine if you're doing a small pilot experiment with 30 samples. But if you're doing a clinical trial with 450 samples, uh, it's just a non-starter. It, it would just take weeks to do ultracentrifugation. Um, also, ultracentrifugation is coming out now is actually kind of squashes. It's, it's kind of violent. And some of the extracellular vesicles don't respond well to that. So you're actually losing some extracellular vesicles by using ultracentrifugation. Um, there are methods, there, there are kits that you can buy. I mentioned the one, the pegylation. Uh, those kits work very well for certain biofluids. They don't work well uh, uh, using the uh, peg to precipitate, doesn't work well for urine in our hands. And it also introduces polyethylene glycol, and that can be a problem if you're doing, for instance, mass spectrometry, which I talked about. If you're looking at proteins, polyethylene glycol can, can get in the way of that uh, method. Um, a new method now, uh, not relatively new method, it's actually quite an old method, <laughs> which is um, size exclusion chromatography is very becoming very popular because it's gentle. It's a great way to, to, to uh, isolate extracellular vesicles away from excess protein uh, in biofluids. The issue with uh, SEC is that it dilutes your sample greatly. And we're actually going to be putting out a kit uh, actually next month that will help you concentrate your vesicles post SEC column, because after you run it, you run say urine through an SEC column, you can get your, um, you can get your vesicles away from free protein, but now it's in a very dilute sample. Your volume say could be 10, 20 milliliters, which is much too big to do a lot of the things you wanna do. Um, so you'll need to concentrate them down. And we're actually gonna put out a kit specific for that purpose. But SEC is definitely becoming more popular uh, than say ultracentrifugation. And again, there's uh, dozens of papers out there which compare all these methods and they all have pros and cons. And you're going to get slightly different preparations uh, depending on what method you use. Yeah, I've heard from one scientist um, over in Europe, which was really strange, they said that um, ultracentrifugation can actually create vesicle-like structures somehow. Not only damages existing ones, but I, I don't know. I guess I don't know if they would, they would contain anything with inside them. But have you ever heard of such a thing, or is that? Uh, I don't system? know. That, I don't know what uh, he or she may be referring to specifically, but I can uh, I can imagine that. So we haven't really talked a lot about these vesicles, but uh, larger vesicles could probably break down into smaller vesicles all the time. And, uh, you know, uh, so if you had larger vesicles, I think during the course of, uh, of using ultracentrifugation, I could envision that uh, the stress of that could uh, break them down into smaller vesicles. And also, <laughs> you can mush together two vesicles, in theory, to make a bigger vesicle. So the, the, the act of ultracentrifugation is, is almost certainly changing uh, vesicles. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of different types of vesicles. There's the exosomes and the microvesicles and the apoptotic bodies. And all of these have been discussed in, when people are trying to define them. And the definitions, by the way, are still in flux in the field. It is a relatively new field and there's going to be change. <laughs> and um, a lot of those definitions include size. Like they'll say microvesicles are typically a little bigger than exosomes. And that's dangerous because Vesicles can change, and you could have a microvesicle that breaks down and makes uh, becomes two smaller uh, vesicles, and now that's going to put them in the range of size of exosomes. And so now you're confused: is that an exosome or is that a microvesicle? So, 
So all of this is in flux. And even me saying that vesicles can change shape and they can uh, change size and, and get mushed together, even that's in discussion. I mean, whether that really happens, how often does it happen? How stable is a vesicle once it's made um, uh, to these kind of forces? So all of this is being studied um, and it, you know, it needs to be worked out. Actually, one thing that came to mind is if uh, you know, two vesicles <laughs> burst or are sheared open, what if their contents interact in some way is to change the, uh, you know, I thought at first, oh, well, so what if the vesicles are damaged that are open? You're still conserving, you know, all the amounts of proteins and other <clears throat> elements that are in them. But again, what if now they interact once they're sheared apart in the process? Right. And if so, yeah, so the problem with a, a vesicle bursting while, uh, while analyzing or while, while isolating, there's, I mean, there's several problems to it. First of all, like you said, they can interact, uh, proteins could interact, and now you've got complexes of proteins that you may be studying. And you're saying, hey, look at, there's all these, you know, there's these protein complexes that may be inside vesicles when they actually were not inside vesicles. They were on, they were inside separate vesicles and they became a complex um, after they broke open. So that, that certainly could be an issue with violent methods for, for isolating uh, vesicles. Um, and, there, and there are certainly other problems with that. Hmm. Yeah, I guess it's very, very complicated. So this, uh, is why the, this is why the NIH is so keen to uh, get standardized methods. Um, so, so people hmm. are using the same types of methods um, w when they're doing their work. So because of your uh, isolation methods, have you been able then to study vesicles in an undisturbed state where they're not broken open? So you can look at their membrane structure. Well, um, that's not super important for us. That is not uh, not our most uh, you know important goal to look at pristine vesicles. Like I said, our one method is actually very good for that. The Weimarite method will precipitate um, extracellular vesicles. We have looked at them under electron microscopy, and we see that they you know they look pristine. Um, and certainly, we could study uh, vesicles. Uh, and look at their structure and so forth using that method. The Y-matrix method actually is not good for that kind of study. It, it's good for looking at, at, in total, what was in the vesicle fraction. And that being because the vesicles bind to our column very tightly, it's hard to get the vesicles off the column. So we usually just take all the protein off the column or all the RNA off the column. Uh, once we've isolated them, and therefore we're breaking open the vesicles while they're actually on the column. And that's really useful for looking at biomarkers because we're getting all this protein. It's a very simple method, so we can look at lots of samples. We did 60 samples in one day uh, the, other, the other day, and I was you know, very proud of Anya Markowska, who works with me, who actually did 60 samples in one day. Uh, you could not do that with other methods, uh, but those other methods, some of those other methods may have uh, some abilities that we couldn't do. So we we put our importance on uh, casting a wide net for biomarkers from the extracellular vesicle fraction. Um, uh, we put our emphasis on that rather on structural studies. And there are a lot of biologists who are studying the structures, and they would might may pick different methods uh, for for isolating their vesicle. What about the different fluids? Like how, how much of a, a diversity is there of stuff, I'll call it, in blood versus in urine versus in saliva versus, you know, other liquids? Yeah, I mean, there's a great deal of diversity. Uh, the biofluid matters a lot. We have done, we, we actually spend several weeks on each biofluid. We move from bi one biofluid to the next when we're doing these studies to optimize our method for that biofluid specifically. And it, it, it we actually took, uh, you know, technically we worked on the urine for four years um, on optimization, but we've, our method works extremely well. The Y-matrix method works extremely well with saliva. Um, it did not take much optimization for that. Um, we've done a little work with saliva. We did a little mass spectrometry. The amount of, uh, you know, there, there's a great deal of difference uh, for, obvious, for obvious reasons, you're getting, uh, you know, vesicles coming from different organs. Um, and of course, if, when you're working with blood plasma or blood serum, uh, pretty much every organ is in contact with blood. So you're going to get vesicles uh, from everywhere. 
and the uh, background is much bigger when you work with blood and your uh, blood than it is when you work for urine. There's basically a thousand times more vesicles in blood than there is in urine, and those vesicles are coming from everywhere in the body, uh, as opposed to uh, you know a smaller subset of the body. And so uh, you're, it's much more difficult, in my opinion, to find biomarkers in blood samples because you're getting, you get a much higher background. Um, uh, so, and there's also a lot more free protein in the blood that you've got to get rid of before you can focus on what's specifically in blood. So you have a background in free protein, you have a background in vesicles from more different places. So Yes, there are very big differences between each biofluid. Yeah, so, well, it's not funny, but it's, it's frustrating, these trade-offs, you know. In blood, you could see probably any biomarker that you wanted to see, but then there's so much more noise. In urine, there's a lot less noise, but I'm sure it's a lot more limited. Well, I, you know, again, I don't want to give you the wrong impression because we, we feel that we have found liver-specific uh, biomarkers in the urine. It's harder to do. Um, uh, they're going to be a lower percentage, but it, you can do it because vesicles are very good at moving around. I mean, there's many papers that show that vesicles can go in either direction through the blood brain barrier. And that's why people are so excited about, uh, you know, looking uh, for Alzheimer's biomarkers um, or Parkinson's biomarkers um, in the blood. Uh, and also using vesicles therapeutically to, to uh, possibly get drugs through the blood-brain barrier uh, to attack brain disease. And there are several papers, including the one that we are going to write, which suggests that you can find um, vesicles in the urine uh, from all over the body. Um, there was a very nice paper that showed that a uh, MER number one, which is fairly specific for the heart, can be found in the urine of animals and patients after a um, AMI event in the heart. And so, you know, it's hard, but you can do it. And because the urine is so easy to collect, it's so easy to get the samples, you could actually, in theory, have people just mail in a urine sample from home. They don't even need a phlebotomist to, to take the blood sample is why we're excited about looking for uh, biomarkers for various diseases in the urine. Um, you could just mail a sample into your doctor once a year and the doctor could check you for various uh, diseases is, is the end goal. Yeah, well, I mean, it could even turn into an at-home type thing. Absolutely. At some point, yeah. You yeah. pee on something and it shows you. That's amazing. That well, makes a lot of sense, what you're saying. Hmm. Yeah, so. it would be, it'd be nice if... <laughs> Instead of me going in for that lung biopsy, all I had to do was take a sample of urine and send it to my doctor and say, hey, just make sure I don't have any lung cancer <laughs> and uh, let me know in a couple of days. <laughs> so that, that would be a wonderful thing. So you've been working at this for a while. In the near term, you know, the next I don't know, one to five years, which in medicine, sadly, is near term. What, what uh things do you expect that you'll be able to what, at what point will you be able to get to with this uh, diagnostics will you have anything on the market or in clinical trials or where will you be in yeah this no so so where we're at we're, our, we're most excited we have a couple of different um projects that we're working on they're all in fairly initial uh, stages i already mentioned the ohsu project uh we've compl where we are with that we completed our pilot study with 60 samples it's actually a pretty big pilot study most pilot studies are are with 10 to 20 samples, we used 60. We've got some very nice data with that. We are now applying for grants and trying to raise money to do a much bigger validation study. That would be three to 400 samples uh, from patients from multiple centers. And this would, we, we would already know what we're looking for here. It would not be a discovery study. And it would be to validate the 12 or so favorite uh, biomarkers that we've we found in the pilot study to see if they are predictive for not only HCC but cirrhosis, but cirrhosis that that comes from different etiologies such as um, hepatitis-based uh, cirrhosis versus NASH-based cirrhosis versus alcoholism. So that would be a study we're raising money for now. We hope to start that study in 2020 and probably finish it in 2021. 
And once that's done, we would then go to an even bigger study. As you mentioned, it takes a long time. It's, it's just as hard to get a biomarker approved by the FDA as it is to get a drug. But, you know, we're in it for the long haul and that's what we want to do. Um, so that's, that's our, our main focus. But in the shorter term, as a company, uh, we are going to release in the next couple of months, a couple of different kits that will help other people replicate the kind of work that we're doing. Um, you know, we've talked to some, a lot of our collaborators are very excited by the method. Uh, we don't want to hoard this method. We want to send this kit out to other people. We have beta tested two kits for the last year or two. We've gotten some very nice feedback on them. And now we're going to launch these kits and advertise and actually become a little kit company here. And that we also believe will help us find uh, more collaborators for biomarker discovery studies. So that's kind of what our plan is for 2020. Launch uh, three kits that will help people uh, do the work that we've been doing and then follow up on, on the uh, OHSU uh, study that we, we, we did last year. Okay. Well, excellent. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't think we're going to get, I don't, wouldn't think we were going to get a biomarker for maybe at least three years that we could Mm. get into the patient's hands. It is a, it's a hard slog. Yeah. Well, very good. Shannon, what's the best way for people to uh, find out more and follow your progress and, you know, maybe ask questions? Well, you mentioned our website. That's a perfectly good uh, place uh, to, to, uh, to find out about, especially in a month from now, we're actually redoing our website in January, but by the end of January, we're going to have a new website with our new kits, uh, put out on them. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, we have a email uh, address on the website, uh, weimarbiosciences.com that you could also use to contact me for general knowledge. Uh, there's an international society for exercise vesicles. They have a great website. They have some online courses that you can take to learn about EVs in general, the background. They have a journal, the Journal of EV. And then there's also a journal that I'm an associate editor of. It's the Journal of Circulating Biomarkers. Uh, it's a brand new journal. It's, uh, it's open access. And you can find out about external vesicles there and also other circulating biomarkers. There are other types of circulating biomarkers that are not exosomal. Well, excellent. Well, Shannon, thank you for coming and for the work that you're doing. And thank you a lot. And great questions, Richard. <laughs> You're definitely knowledgeable yeah. about, the, about the subject. I'm trying. Thank you. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.